Well folks, the end of the year is coming up and I figured I'd do one more repair and startup video before everything comes to a close. And we got a bit of a unique piece this time. As you can see, it's a homemade walk-behind tractor, mostly constructed out of wood, which is pretty darn cool. It's definitely a little bit of Yankee ingenuity going on. So I ended up picking this up from a customer, Rick, over the summer. I went up on a service call to look at his John Deere 650 and he showed me his collection of garden tractors. He's actually got a pretty nice collection of stuff up there and he had this kicking around and he was kind enough to let me take it home and give it to me. So apparently from what he had told me, if I remember correctly, he got this from a lady down the street whose father had worked for the railroad company and her father ended up building this. And we don't know what he had on the front of it, whether it was a plow or some sort of power driven implement because there is a V-belt pulley on the side of this engine here that could have driven something on the front of these brackets. So unfortunately there was nothing else with it. It was just as you see it right here is how he had picked it up. But the ingenuity and the thought process and the design that went into it, it's really cool and it's definitely worth getting going again because it's not something that you see and that's very common nowadays on how everything is constructed and very well thought out. It does have forward which is right here and it also has a reverse gear on the other side here. It does have a working differential down there, which I'll pull the bottom plate off so you guys can look at that. He has differential ring gears on the back for ballast. It does have a Briggs, I think it's a 6S engine, even though it's labeled as a Sears and Roebuck. But I'm assuming it's a 6S because it has these shroud tabs here and here, and I usually see those on the 6S's, but not the 5S's. But maybe Colin can correct me on that because I could be wrong. But anyways, we're going to get the thing going again today, running and driving around. I have no idea what I'm going to do with it, folks, but <laughs> it sure is a cool piece. So I figured it'd be worth bringing to the tractor show in the springtime or the summer or whenever I end up going and put it on display. It's just a homemade unit. So anyways, the first thing that I'm going to do before I get into the engine and try to get that running, I didn't have a chance to power wash this because it's been pretty cold lately and I didn't know if it was going to dry well in time for the video. So I am going to get it cleaned up a little bit and also pull the skid pan off the bottom of it so you guys can look at the differential and everything else and just get it ready to work on and then we can delve into it. I got everything blown off and cleaned up and as you can see I took the skid pan off on the bottom here so that way you guys can see the differential. And this was a pretty healthy size differential for what this little unit is. I don't know what he got it out of, if it came out of a small tractor or if it was a, I don't think it would be a car differential because it doesn't look like it's going to be heavy enough, but it must have been some kind of piece of equipment. It does have grease fittings on it, which I imagine that he probably put in there. I do have one here and I also have one here as well. And it also has grease fittings on the axles for the wheels and in a few other spots too. So it's a pretty heavy duty differential. It does need some grease and some oil because the spider gears move pretty darn stiff when you go to turn each wheel independently. So that's all gonna have to get lubed up. And I figured you guys would get a kick out of this too. So here's your bearing covers, either side. As you can see, they're notched so that way you can loosen them and just spin them to the side and take them off to service your bearings. So. I would imagine whereas most guys if they were building something like this would probably just put either a brass bushing in a piece of wood or a pillow block or something like that. This guy went as far as to bore out these pieces of 2x4 or whatever they are. They're pretty actually heavier than that and put full size ball bearings into each one to run the shaft through. I think these ones are actually pretty darn impressive. That's a lot of ball bearing folks for what this thing is. I mean that's something you'd find in like a a gravely transmission or something like that. That's pretty darn heavy duty. So the build quality on this thing was pretty extensive, at least for what it is, for being a wooden walk behind tractor. So I thought that was pretty darn cool. So he put heavy bearings in them and he also made them so you can take the covers off so they're protected and that way you can grease them too. So it's fully serviceable, which I like. And of course on the other side, is the same thing as this side. You can see he has the top of the paint can here and of course another bearing cap on the bottom and they're both constructed the same way with the little notches so you can loosen them up and spin them and take them off. So I thought that was pretty darn cool. And then on the inside here we have the forward belt in the middle 
and then the reverser which is going to be on this side over here and you can see the reverse gear what he had used for that I don't know what they came out of but they're beveled gears with a pulley on one end of it and that also too has a grease fitting right here so that can be greased and it just has a small idler that you pull back like so and it reverses the direction on the jack shaft that runs down to the differential gear so it was a very well thought out little rig and it's actually pretty cool that it was preserved and well kept this long it wasn't left outside to rot away or anything like that so now that we get this thing all cleaned up and you guys can see all the workings of it we're going to put this thing down raise up the lift and see about getting this Briggs engine all squared away so we can get thing, the thing to fire up. First thing I'm going to do with this Briggs is see if we can get spark out of the coil and everything so I get the shroud and the flywheel pulled off and then take a look at the ignition system and see what that looks like. So there's no crank play on this thing, but the coil has been dragging on the flywheel, which would account for some of the resistance aside from the jack shafts moving. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it from there, but there's a drag mark all the way around this thing where the legs that come down here have been pushing onto the flywheel. Not by much, but by enough to make it wear in just a little tiny bit but I don't think it's been like that for very long, probably just since I've been spinning it over. And just as a side note, these old Briggs do have left-handed threads on the crankshaft, so if you try to spin it off the usual way, it ain't gonna come off. As you can see, there's the mark where the coil was pushing on it as it was going around. Shined it up a little bit, but didn't groove it or anything like that. So, so this Briggs here is the first one that I've seen with studs that hold on this points cover right here. There's studs there and there. Points really don't look all that bad. They're definitely usable. There's a tiny little pit on the bottom, but not enough to make a difference. They're just corroded up a little bit, so most likely we'll get spark out of this without a doubt. And then we just got to readjust that for up against the flywheel. We're going to run a little bit of 400 grit sandpaper between these and get them all shined up and ready to go. So the point's cleaned up nice with a 400. They have two shiny faces on either side, so I think we're going to get some good spark out of that. So the last thing I'm going to do is just adjust these. They're supposed to be at 20 thousandths, and these ones are a little bit loose. So we're just going to snug them up a little bit before the flywheel goes back on. Now, it didn't move much, but it was just enough to get the feeler gauge to snug up just a tiny bit. So while we're here and before the flywheel goes back on, might as well scrub up these legs a little bit. They're really not that dirty or that rusty for that matter. So I went ahead and cleaned up the flywheel too. I just hit it on the edge here with a little bit of 400 grit after I degreased it and it shined it up nice. The magnet is still in good condition as you can see and the scoring obviously like I said isn't going to be an issue. So we can get this mounted back up. So the air gap on these magnetos on the 5 and 6S engines is 12 to 16 thousandths. So we're going to start with a, I'm going to get it as close as I can at 12, but I'm going to start with a 14 and set it to that and then see what it does because sometimes you can set these and as soon as you tighten it down it twists one way or another and it ends up going closer to the flywheel. So if we start with a bigger air gap and we snug this down 
we should be pretty darn close to 12. At least that's the goal. So 12 fits through. It passes through just touching. So I think that'll be good enough. And of course the tolerance goes up to 16,000. So we're still within the margin. But the closer you can get it, the better. That the third leg in the middle usually ends up riding a little bit higher than the outside legs. So I always set these to the outside legs and then whatever the inside leg is, so be it. Most likely we're still going to get spark out of it anyways. Now we got a nice hot blue spark. I don't know if you guys will be able to even see that on the camera, but it's snapping across pretty well. So our ignition system is good, which is nice, of course. And now we can move on to the carburetor and the fuel tank and get that all squared away. So on this engine, there's no governor setup or anything on here. There's some linkages down below here, if you can see my hand, below this shroud, but nothing's been hooked up. And at one point, the throttle cable just hooked directly to the carburetor on the top, which unfortunately the little mount for the throttle cable has since broken off of there. So we're going to have to figure out something for that to get a cable back onto this thing. I do have a parts carburetor. And I can pull that out of it. If it's not the right size, we'll rig up something that mounts to the top here. That way we can get the cable hooked back up. All right, folks, so there's really not too much to these carburetors. All it really has is a pickup tube down the bottom, which works off of a vacuum, and this little adjusting screw on the side for your idle, which also sort of does your high idle too. It's kind of a one thing that does both. And on this one also, somebody had soldered on a little T-handle to it, which, once again, thought was kind of neat. So it's a little bit more ease of adjustment. And it looks like what they used for a T-handle is an old spade from a plug for like a wall outlet or something like that. So, kind of neat. So the gasket's still on here. I do have a new one of those, and along with a new flange gasket up here. The screen is nice and clean. A lot of these that I end up cleaning out, that screen is all gummed up with shellac and whatnot. Some of these also have a check ball down inside of here which will get stuck to when it's all shellacked up. So I end up cutting the screen out, cleaning everything out, and then I have some really fine mesh that I'll cut to go over this, and then I'll take some mechanics wire and twist it around the base here. That way I have a screen back on here to filter the fuel. And obviously this guy did not have an air cleaner or anything for the top, so he took an old cap from a bottle or something, screw cap, and he put that on here for an air cleaner or just to keep the water, moisture, whatever out. It sure ain't going to keep the dust out of it. Hopefully that focuses enough where you can see it. It says 125 volts AC. So it looks like he used the base of a lamp socket to make his air cleaner cover. You can see the threads right there. And then there's little, looks like copper rivets that he attached the bottle cap with right there and there that go through the top. So that was kind of cool. And it also looks like the mud wasps got in here too, and they filled up, they actually filled up the entire carburetor. Because there's a, there's a plate in here that moves the wind. I can't think of the, what it would be called right now, but it's got a helix to it, so it goes like this when it goes inside. And you can actually pull these plates out of here with a pair of needle nose pliers if you have to pull this butterfly out, which we might have to do. So... I'm going to have to take a pick and see if I can loosen up most of that mud wasp nest, get that dumped out of there, and then we should be able to pull out that plate so we can access our throttle butterfly. So that's the helix that's down inside of the carburetor. Just a bent piece of metal, real simple like. I got the throttle butterfly out of this, so that way I can clean out the throat of the carburetor. I don't have a wire brush that fits all the way down there, but I'll get the rest of that scraped out and cleaned out. 
and there is the <clears throat> the butterfly for this thing these things come out pretty easy there's no screw some of these do have a screw and a plate in them but these ones don't these really small ones I forgot which models had the plate and the screw down there but this one right here this there's supposed to be a little tang here that the throttle cable hooks to or the governor linkage and everything which is gone and you can still do this regardless because you'll back off the idle screw all the way and then what you do is you turn this past where it should be and you can see where this little stop is right here on the top and you have this boss that sticks out from the casting once you get it past there you just wiggle a little bit and it slides right out of the top that way you can clean out your carburetor your ventry you know and all that junk whatever you want to call it, throw it at the carburetor so because the mud wasps were in there, I had to pull that out. That way I can get everything cleaned out nice. I might hit this with the glass bead blaster to get rid of those wasps' nests that are way up inside of here. And it would also give me a chance to clean out the seat for the idle needle too, the little brass seat, and get that cleaned up. But aside from that, folks, it's really not that bad whatsoever. So it's going to be an easy cleanup job. So I'll get this thing ready to go back together and then check in with you guys before I reassemble gas tank and all the carburetor parts have been cleaned up in the glass bead blaster and as you can see all the mud wasps have been cleaned out of the throat of the carburetor so that's all nice and clean and ready to go back together along with the mounting surface for it and the tube of course is all cleaned out gas tank blew out nice there was just powdery gas left in there and whether you can see it or not it looks just the same as this on the outside so clean as a whistle and ready to take some new gaskets and as for the throttle butterfly, or the throttle shaft, I suppose you could say, I had found the other piece that broke off of it. Somebody had made a homemade bracket on here at one point to hold the throttle cable and everything, which was this. And that little cast aluminum piece was still screwed to this, hanging off the back side of it. So I did make a feeble attempt to get it to solder on there. Obviously enough, it didn't work. I don't have the correct aluminum soldering paste or maybe even the aluminum uh, solder for that matter, but I figured I'd give it a whirl anyways. So what I'm going to do, instead of making a real intricate bracket and I was going to thread, uh, drill and tap and thread a hole so I could screw everything onto the top of this and so on. I know it's kind of shoddy, but this thing isn't going to get a lot of use and there's also very minimal tension on that little piece sticking out too. So I'm going to end up taking and JB welding that back on there as neatly as I possibly can and that'll be sufficient enough to hold this on. I don't have any more of these little carburetors like this. I have the next size up which would be this one right here and this one of course does have a good throttle shaft and all the bracketry and everything that I need but it's too big around. I even checked my new old stock parts and unfortunately thought I did but apparently I don't have any of those. So we're going to make a do with what we got and get this one repaired so we get some JB weld on there and then we can finish assembling the carburetor, fuel system and everything and I can drop this in tomorrow after it's dried. So we can start with this little piece right here. I suppose I still can't think of what I want to call this thing but it goes down into the throttle tube or the ventry or whatever you want to call it. Most of these when I pull them apart they're always horizontal like so. They don't have any little tangs or anything in here that hold them into the orientation and they just press right in like that. It's like a tapered fit almost. And they should sit just about flush with that face. And that's all there is to it. They don't stick down into this area so I can still mount that in there tomorrow. And then we can screw in our little jet on the side. And this has all been blown out and cleaned out after I ran it through the glass bead blaster. And then of course our adjustable jet can go in next, which I did take this apart and oil it a little bit, so that way we can adjust it when everything's together and running. So these I usually set at about one turnout. They don't take much to adjust. Most of the time I only end up turning them out anywhere from half to one when they're running is about the adjustment for these but you got to kind of play it by ear as you're running the engine because they vary a little bit depending so I went ahead and cleaned up this mating surface right here for the carburetor gasket so that's all been squared away and of course this one was all glass bead blasted so that's nice and clean and ready for the new gasket 
Now, normally on these engines, once again, you might be able to see it from the camera. There's some fixtures and stuff and whatnot behind this shroud over here. And that is your governor linkages and throttle linkages where the cable would come in from the bottom, hooked to this stuff, and then you'd have other linkages and whatnot that would come off of this little arm on the side and then it would hook to the throttle shaft. But obviously enough, there's nothing on here. There's no governors left on it. So I'm just gonna run it as it has been and run the cable straight to the throttle shaft and regulate it by hand. <clears throat> regulate it by hand for as much as this thing's gonna be actually getting used. And now the tank's ready to go on. We've got our brand new gasket on there. These are about the simplest Briggs carburetors to rebuild folks and clean out. There's absolutely nothing to them. Alright, so of course we have our gas cap too, which he also modified this as well for a breather. And he put a little stem on there from the tire tube soldered that on and then this gasket had fallen out when I was blowing this out and he has a square piece of plate underneath this breather almost like a check valve which I've never seen on these before so I don't think that's OEM brakes but once again I could be wrong but I thought that was kind of a unique little modification as well so with our carburetor all together fuel system all squared away and our engine that has spark we are ready to fire this up tomorrow when the throttle shaft is all dried up. So in the meantime, I do have to get the rest of this tractor ready so that way I can drive it around and make sure that everything is lubed up. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna see if we can get some oil into these bearings and then maybe pack a little bit of grease into them. I did start to oil these ones here so I could spin the engine over and then we can flip this thing up and then see about getting that big differential gear down yonder way and get that all oiled up and see if those fittings will take some grease and get everything moving as it should. On this side, when I took this cap off, thought this was kind of neat too. He even made his own gasket for the cap out of a cardboard box of some sort. Not like it's going to keep much of the grease from falling out, but it might hold off some of the dirt and the dust and the larger chunks that could fall into it. So I thought that was pretty cool as well. So this differential seems to spin fairly well, like so. The belt drag is kind of making it a little bit stiff, which is all right. But it won't, if I can get the spider gears here so you guys can see them, it doesn't want to do this very well. It's very stiff. So I gotta see if I can get some oil down in here, along with some grease on these fittings. get these to free up a little bit. Now they both took this one I can't turn down here to hit it because the chain is going to be in the way of the grease gun. Yeah, you might be able to see the screw spinning right there. So the pin that it sets on is actually spinning in the carrier casting. So it's stuck on there fairly well, too. But once it gets a little bit of oil into it, it seems to be doing just fine. I don't really want to go put a ton of grease on this because it's an open carrier. There's nothing protecting it. Granted, the oil is going to have a lot of stuff sticking to it, but the grease will get really messy if it gets a lot of dirt and junk stuck to it. So this will be sufficient. There you have it, folks. Amazing what a little bit of grease and oil will do. 
last thing I'm going to do is just hit this chain with a little bit of WD-40 like I did with the engine drive chain. That way, as I drive it around, it'll help loosen it up a little bit. I get everything oiled and greased up on the underside for the drive. I took some of the pulleys off, the idler pulleys, for the belt tensioners and get those oiled up as well. So now that that's all done, I can get the skid plate put back on. Well folks, after a couple of days of letting everything dry, this is what I came up with for the throttle on this engine. As you can see, I got the little tab welded back on here with, well, not welded, but JB welded back on here with the screw through it. So that's the throttle stop. And then I also have this little piece of metal right here that I had fashioned for it and then I JB welded to the top. So now, when I move the throttle cable, I can move the throttle open and close. So that was actually the piece that this screw was originally through that was originally screwed to this thing and I just flattened it out and trimmed it down some and it seems to work out just fine for what this thing is. I did, as I mentioned before, think about setting up the throttle of the governor setup because I do have the arm left over here and some linkages down below, but for the sake of what this thing is, a self-regulated throttle will be just fine for what I'll be doing with it. So anyways, folks, now we can get this thing off the table, take it outside, and see if we can get this old Briggs to fire up.
Well, it turned out to be a nice running little rig, folks. I can't imagine that he used it for much. Maybe some pushing some light snow or having just a little cart on the front like I figured because this thing really doesn't have too much power. Even driving up the hill in the backyard here, it's steep, but it's not too bad. And you really got to wind up this Briggs to keep it from dying out. So I can't imagine that it was used for any real heavy or extensive work. But most likely, it was built to fit his needs and it beat doing whatever he was doing manually, whether it was moving material or just plowing stuff around, who knows. But either way, it's a pretty darn cool piece to add into the collection. So anyways, if you see this, Rick, I do appreciate it. It definitely went to a good home and it'll be on display at the tractor shows this year. But aside from that, folks, that's the repair and startup of the homemade wooden walk-behind tractor.